started the top blessing, holiness, we talked about what little I understand of the concept of holiness. We talked about Shem and Shkup and being. Um, I just want to add one um, footnote to that discussion. It says here, you are holy and your name is holy. Now, um, that does not mean that the four letters, a yud and a hey, and above and a hey, is holy. It's not a sequence of letters. In fact, there's a verse of Deuteronomy where it speaks of fearing your name. And the words, your name, there, that verse mean God. They don't mean to be afraid of the four letters. Um, so, name, those of you who are with me when we talked about reincarnation, the idea of name carrying the essence of something, something. Um, but the, juxtaposed to you are holy, one has to ask, what's the difference between saying you are holy and your name is holy? Now, um, the pre one of the great Hasidic thinkers, offers an analysis of a name. To me, as a philosopher, very interesting to see that Lahavdal Charles Sanders Purpose, Purse, living in America at about the same time, came up with the exact same analysis of the concept of a name. Obviously, neither of them uh, knew the other. And the idea of a name is really a three-part relationship. There is a thing. There is a person who wants to talk about that thing or think about that thing. And the name is a tool that he uses for that talking or thinking. So we, the idea of a name is three things standing in a relationship. An object, a thinker or a speaker, and the tool, which we call the name, which enables the relationship to be set up. Then roughly, and, uh, for the recording, I'm just saying, I study philosophy of language and I taught philosophy of language, so I know the complexities, uh, Kripke's work and Strawson's work and all the others, but I'm not using that now. Roughly, when you talk about a name, you're talking about a person's picture of the thing that he's talking about. What he has in mind when he talks about that thing. Now, that's going to be very different from the thing itself. Always it's um, missing an infinity of information about the thing that he's talking. Um, and in the case of God, that's for sure true. So I think what's being said here is a double message. Number one, if I make any assertion about God, all I've got to go on is what I understand. Or what other people understood and they told me. There's nothing more that you can go on when you talk about anything other than what you have in your mind or what you trust that other people had in their minds. But you must never confuse what you have in your mind with the thing itself. The thing itself always outruns what you have in mind. Even if you're talking about Mount Everest or a, a dog, there's an infinity of information that you don't have about it that your, well, your conception in your mind doesn't, doesn't capture. All the more so when you're talking about the infinite creator of the universe. So when we talk about holiness, we have to acknowledge that what we go on is our understanding, but we don't limit our assertion to our understanding. What we say is that just as God is beyond, separate, different, divorced from, that holds for my conception of what God is, that also holds for God above and beyond my conception. That is how I would describe the difference between you are holy and your name is holy. The, the second is a much more limited statement. And it's important to say that because it acknowledges where my judgment comes from. Okay, that's the end of the three blessings of petition. Uh, sorry, of, of praise. Now we come to the blessings of petition. And I've mentioned to you before that the purpose of prayer is petition. That's why you appear before God, to ask for things. That's why you're going in. Praise at the beginning is a way of indicating that I have some grasp of who you are and who I am and how we are related. And it's also a formal thing. You don't just walk in and say, hey, give me X. But the whole purpose of the exercise is to ask God for things. And that needs to be understood. That needs to be thought about before we go into the details of the petitions. Um, some want to know, surely God knows what I need before I ask. So wouldn't it be just redundant to ask? What can I say to God that he doesn't already know? That's one thing. 
Another question which is raised in the literature, Sefer Ikrim deals with it in some detail, is this. To ask for something, you must believe that your asking could have an effect on the outcome. If you had reason to, to believe that your asking will not be taken into account, that God will, make, it will have no relevance to God's decision, then asking would be absurd, and nowhere does the Torah ever require us to do something absurd. That belongs to other religions, and people may be attracted to that, but it's not Judaism. Judaism never requires us to do something absurd. So we have to believe that our asking could have an effect. It doesn't have to be guaranteed to have an effect. Surgery is not guaranteed. It's still worthwhile doing. But to be foreclosed, to think that God certainly will not take into account my, my request, would make it absurd. So we can't believe that. Now the question is, what reason do we have for thinking that he will take it into account? What do we think we understand about God, about how he runs the world, that would give us some confidence that he will take it into account, whether he'll in the end agree or not, but he'll take it into account. And there is an objection that's raised here. Sefer Ikrim raises this objection. And the objection can be raised in two forms. One is very simplistic, and the other is more sophisticated. But both of them are objections. The simplistic form is this. God is just. God is just. Now let's say I'm asking him for Q. Well, either I deserve Q or I don't. If I deserve Q, then God, being just, will give it to me, even if I don't ask. Because I deserve it. And if I don't deserve Q, then God, being just, won't give it to me, even if I do ask. Because I don't deserve it. So then, my asking makes no difference. Then my asking really makes no difference. It plays no role. So then, asking is going to be absurd and we can't justify it. Now, I say that's simplistic because it imagines that God deals with the world only on the basis of justice. That's not true. God deals with the world in a myriad of ways. Some of you who have been here for a while know that loving kindness trumps justice, is more important than justice. And there are many other factors that God takes into account. But one could still ask, with all the factors God would take into account, listen, I'm asking for Q. If I get Q, it'll have an effect on my children, effect on my spouse, effect on my neighbors, effect on my ability to teach in the yeshiva. There are all sorts of things to take into account other than just my deserving it. Still, why would asking for it be important? Why would asking for it be one of the relevant factors? That's a question that needs an answer. Now, I have a whole hour sheer on that, and it's a chapter in a book that I wrote, so I'm not going to give you the whole thing. I just want to give you a couple of leading ideas with which you can get a hold on it. What we're really asking is to look at us making a request from God's point of view and to try to understand that God would have a stake in taking the request seriously and sometimes answering it because the request was made. That's what we want to be able to understand. And I want to introduce you to two levels of requests, two out of at least three, uh, and, and ask the question for each one. Uh, level one of request is this. Please, God, give me a 2015 Porsche. Why? Because I like nice cars. You know, leather seats, quadraphonic sound, uh, you know, uh, GPS, um, uh, uh, Climate control, uh, cruise control, the works. Dear God, give me the car. Why? Because I like nice cars. I'm asking it wholly, selfishly. I want it because I'm going to enjoy it. Is there any spiritual value in a request like that? Is there any reason for God to take that request seriously and to say, at least sometimes, yeah, he asked for it, so I'm going to give it to him. When the request is totally selfish um, I mean there is an idea that for that the Russians who succeed in this world are gaining the reward for what they get in the next world. <laughs> yes but so that wouldn't they... be dependent upon the request God could say listen this person is evil and I wanted to pay him off in this world I'm going to pay him even if he doesn't ask and so the person who asks for it though might receive it if it's from you know the his reward for the next world. But not because he asked. 
If that's why it's being given to him, it'll come well, to him even if he doesn't ask. Right, but it could be that this specific thing is given to him. He said, oh, this is what you want? Okay, so this I'll give you. But then the question is, why would he do that? If the whole purpose is only to pay him off in this world so he won't get a reward in the next world, then there's a certain amount that he has to get. And the choice of the object may be dependent upon what it'll do for his children, what it'll do for the environment, and so forth and so on. Why would his requesting it be a factor that could tip the scales and say, because you asked for this, you get it. If you didn't, hadn't asked, you wouldn't get it. Maybe asking for it is not evil in and of itself. Say again, I can't hear you. Maybe asking for a car like that yeah. is an act of evil in and of itself. Oh, and then add to the evil. Maybe, maybe, but um, you know, that, that, I suppose, could play a role. In it. But I, I don't, think, don't, yeah. Don't we ask for ourselves so we don't take it for granted? Okay, now you're moving in a different direction. I asked... What stake God could have in answering the request? Now, something from God's point of view, you're trying, but I think, I think you're on a, on, a, on, a stronger, on a stronger ground. After all, there are a lot of people who want 2015 Porsche and don't ask for it. They go out and earn the money, or they steal the money, or they you know, steal a Porsche, or whatever they do. They don't ask for it. A person who asks for it is acknowledging that God exists, and is acknowledging that God is running the world, God has the keys to the warehouse, and he's the one who's going to deliver it. That's not zero in spiritual terms. There are a lot of people who don't even have that. So God may say, listen, this person believes in my existence. He knows that I'm running the world. I want to reinforce that. And from time to time, he'll say yes. So here's where even a totally selfish request of God has some spiritual value. And God can, we can understand God wanting to reinforce, to reinforce that. A much higher level, it's much higher, but I think everyone can ascri- aspire to it, is to say, I'm asking God for something because I know it will help me serve him. I'm dedicated to serving him. That's my goal in life. I think that's the most important thing that should be done in the world. But being in bed with a flu, with a 102 fever, I can't teach in the yeshiva, I can't participate in the minion in the synagogue, I can't uh, visit people in the hospital, I find it difficult to deal with my grandchildren who can be, you know, be challenging from time to time. Um, and I say to God, please make me healthy so that I can serve you better. If my goal in asking is to be able to serve him, then I think God has an obvious direct stake in that kind of request and wants to reinforce that kind of request. First of all, it reinforces my identity as a servant of God, and that's something which is spiritually precious. Second of all, if I ask God with that thought in mind, that I'm asking for it in order to be able to serve him, I'm preparing myself psychologically so that when I get it, I'll use it to serve him. So God will have a double interest in answering that kind of request. This is the tip of a, of a larger discussion, but the, but the bottom line here is, in order, to, uh, in order for making a petition... Not to be futile, I've got to be able to believe that it is something that God values, takes into account, and sometimes could tip the scales, and we now have positive reason for thinking that. Okay? But the, the practical impact here is when, you, when you're in this section of the Shemana Esri and you're making requests, you have to imagine at any moment that the Malach, the angel who's the intermediary in this communication, stops you and says, hey, you asked for Q, why do you want that? And to have an answer ready. Why you want it? Be able to say, I want it because I need it to be able to serve you in this and this way. Okay, now let's start to look at the particular requests. First one is titled. The English words here are just hopeless because the Hebrew concepts are deep and they're partly uh, treated in the Kabbalah and in the deep philosophical works. And uh, I should just tell you, all dictionaries have mistakes. All dictionaries have lots of mistakes. So if you find that an English translation isn't very faithful to the original, the translator is facing an impossible task. He's got to translate a Hebrew word, a technical, deep Hebrew word, with one or two word phrase. He can't write a whole page for each word. This is a sitter. People have to pray out of this sitter. And if I offer suggestions that aren't on the page, not by way of criticizing the, the translator, just he's, he's doing something that's... Uh, impossible to do uh, in, in any great depth. Now here, you graciously endow, that's pretty good, man with wisdom, 
We'll see about that. Teach man. It's tied to a frail mortal. That's good for the connotation of the word in Hebrew. And thou hast graciously from yourself, we'll have to work on that, looking from yourself with wisdom, insight, and discernment. Bless you, Hashem, giver of wisdom. So, the Hebrew words here are Deya bin of Haskel. There's another word which other texts, the Sephardi texts and some of the Hasidic texts use, and that's Chachma. These are all terms from the Kabbalah. Let's take them apart one by one. I'm going to put it in Chachma because it's the top of a certain shade. Chachma, in one use, is where you have an insight, you can see where the solution to the problem is, you can see where you have to go to get it, and your experience can teach you that when you have that flesh, you've really got it. Because your experience teaches you that when you have that flesh and you work on it, you're able to eventually articulate it and express it Describe it and make it and make it function. But at the moment of insight, you can't do that yet. Um, I suppose that you've had experiences like that. The one very dramatic one that I know about was, was Paul Dirac, one of the great workers in the in quantum mechanics. He was working on finding a an equation for the for the electron, and he worked on it for months. And he's a gigantic genius, and he describes he's British. He's getting off a bus in London. As he stepped off the bus, the solution hit him. It took him three days to write it out. But he had that flash of insight. And as I say, from experience, you can know that when you have that flash, it's there. It's there. It'll take a long, a lot of effort to work it out, to say it out, to write it out in, in, in detail, but the, but the flash is there. That's Chochmah. Sometimes Chochmah is, is um, taken apart as Koachmah. It's an unknown Potential. Potential that comes from elsewhere. By the way, Rashi's definition of Chachmah is what you learn from your teachers. Chachmah is often translated as wisdom. I don't think that's the English concept of wisdom at all. A person is described as wise because he has his own internal abilities. Not because he learned a lot from other people. But for us, wisdom essentially comes from outside. And whether it comes from your teachers, as Rashi says, or whether it comes from a divine inspiration, where God plants an idea in your mind, but anyone who experiences it knows he didn't make it. You know, you have this in iconography. You have the light bulb that goes off, right? What do we say in English? The thought hit me. That's very expressive. Hit me means it's something outside of me that acts on me. Not that I built it, created it, formed it, cooked it up. No, it hit me. That's the way you experience it. Uh, again, the Greeks talked about creative people having a muse, a muse of some kind of semi-divine agent, and it delivers music or art or poetry into your mind, and then you just unravel it. That's the way it's experienced. That's Chochmah. Chochmah is that uh, un as yet unformed insight. Bina, the word Bina comes from the word Bain. Bain means between. Bain is how you make distinctions, how you create categories. All speech is dependent upon words which are, have definitions and uh, cut reality into pieces and uh, set up relationships between separate entities. That's what language does. Bina is expressing that insight of Chochmah in words. Das is experiential knowledge. As everyone knows, there are a lot of things you've got to learn from experience. So that would be our English version of wisdom. I don't know. I think ability, wisdom in English... Ability sounds more like intelligence, whereas wisdom is something that you accrue over time. But yeah, but you accrue, you accrue lingu linguistic learning over time also. You know, you take, take Shakespeare 1 and Shakespeare 2 and Shakespeare 3. Right? And you're, I, yeah. Well, okay, I, I, I'm inclined to... to right. yeah, you know, I, I think it's very loose in English. I think it's very loose in English, but it could be. It could be. Uh, people who think up strategies. Like older people are wise because they've seen a lot of things. It's like the it could be, but, but you know... Um, and they know better. They know better than the young I mean, I, I, don't, I don't want to... I, I, think it's, I think you couldn't force it by just reflecting on, on how it's used. Um, but I, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not fighting with it. I don't mind. My, I'm interested in das. I'm not interested in the word wisdom. I'm interested in the word das. The das is, the, is what comes from 
it comes from learning. It comes from experience. experience. Things that you learn from experience. Now, there are two things to be said here. For example, as uh, people know, it speaks about Adam knowing Chava, right? And that's sexual relations, right? So that's obviously an experience. Um, there are things you learn from experience, but very often your ability to learn from experience depends upon your abstract knowledge. If you didn't have that abstract knowledge, you wouldn't be able to learn from experience. Imagine watching a chess game. If you don't know the rules, if you didn't learn the rules, which are expressed in words, then watching the board, move pieces on the board, would be meaningless to you. Very often the two go hand in hand. That you are not able to learn from the experience unless you have some abstract knowledge that you bring to understanding what's going on in front of you. But the experience becomes indispensable. You can't express what it's like to go swimming in words. You can't express what the sound of the violin is like in words. There are many things that can only be learned from experience. So now what do we have? A flash of intellectual insight that's before words, the use of words to express it in terminology, which can be transmitted to others. And by the way, the Jewish sources say that uh, that, in, that in original insight can't be wholly expressed in words. That original insight can spin off more and more verbal formulations as time goes on. It can't be wholly expressed in words. It's too rich to be wholly expressed in words. Experiential knowledge comes from a different, a different aspect of life altogether. Haskell, which is the final word that you have here, is the ability to take your knowledge and your understanding and put it into practically effective action. Even people who have learned a great deal from experience may not have the ability to put something into practically effective action. Take, for example, observing people and reading their psychological state. There are some people who are whizzes at this, and there are some people who are very, very poor at this. Typically, they're divided between female and male. That's the normal division. But from the fact that someone is exquisitely sensitive to another person's psychological state doesn't mean that person automatically knows what to do to help that person. That's a separate, a separate understanding, a separate ability. That's Haskell. So now, in this blessing, we are asking God for these qualities, help in applying these qualities, the results of these qualities. That's what this is addressed to. Now, in this blessing, in the Ashkenazi version, which is what we are looking at, it's very interesting that the words don't appear at the same number of times. Das appears three times. Um, Bina twice. And I mean, Das and Dea I'm taking to be the same, and Haska once. That's not trivial. The number of, number of occurrences is, uh, is very important. And the heavy emphasis here is on Das. Why that is exactly, I don't know. If it had been three times Bina and, 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 and twice Das or once Das, no, one could make up explanations, but the heavy emphasis here is on das. What's the difference between God and Dea? I, I think it's poetical. It's not. It's the same. It's the same quality. So, so bina is is the knowledge that somebody taught you in language, and then das is the experience knowledge, and that gives you the insight. No, 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 no. It goes it goes the other way. The insight starts first at the top. The insight is at the top, and that. It, the way I describe it is something that comes from God, and it's a flash of insight which doesn't yet have words. You can't explain it to anybody, you can't communicate it to anybody, you can't write it down. Yet, you sort of see the way forward. Then you work on it to articulate it in your own mind. You try it here, you try it there, you try it everywhere. For example, um, sometimes people are searching for words. You know, I wish I could describe to you how I feel, but I don't, I don't know, I can't tell you how I feel because I've got the right words. And then after a while I say, I know, I'm anxious. That's what it is. I'm not afraid, I'm not worried, I'm not depressed, I'm anxious. So, so you found the word. There was a reality there, and you didn't have the word yet to describe that reality. You're looking at a flower, you're looking at a statue, talking to somebody in the phones. What is it like? What is it like? I, I don't know what to say. You know, you walk around, you think, you say, yeah, it's... What is it's, that called? That's called... Uh, that's like Chochmah. 
That's like chachma because you haven't got words yet. Oh, this is like the the, spe- like the spheres. The correct, like, correct, like, like the spheres. Correct, correct. Yeah, we're all talking the same thing. You know, I could have talked about spheres also, but <laughs> no, that he, he does direct, and I do it indirect. Like but but so it's when you but, that idea. before you have words. Before you have words. Before you have words. Before right now, by the way, it may never, it may never, it may never come down to words. Yeah. Let's suppose you have a problem with a relationship with somebody, and you don't know what to do. And suddenly it hits you. I know what to do. So he says, okay, so what does he want to do? <laughs> I know how to do it. I've done it before in other cases, but I don't know what to tell you. You know, 30% discipline and 20% pure love and 14% encouragement. And I don't care. I just why know what to do. You, why can't you tell him based on your experience? Because you may not have the words to tell him. So you have to like incubate it. And, you know, you, you know it, when, when, when a chess master looks at a board and, he's, and, he's say, and then he moves his, his knight. Why does he move the knight? Because I'm going to win. That's why. How do you know you're going to win? I've done this before. What are you doing? What? What? what you know? What? At this point, you move the knight. I know because then, then I win. <laughs> what are the words? You know, strengthen the left side of the board, or because it has a forked move rather than a bishop's move. I know to move the knight, and when I move the knight, I win. It doesn't have the words. It's not something that you put into words. There's a big mistake when I was in when I was your age. This was all the, the rage, and it took decades to outgrow it. That thought is in words. Only a minority of thought is in words. A great deal of thought is not in words. A great deal of thought can't be put into words. That's something that they came to realize later. And now they're much more liberal about how thought takes place. Thought takes place in multiple, in, in many different dimensions. And many of them are not thoughts in words. A great deal of problem solving takes place without words. Um, do you ever do mathematics? I mean, I know this sounds like a, like a nightmare. Do you ever do mathematics? One of the things you have to do is prove theorems. I was a math major. You're a math major. Okay, so when you're looking... I never explain how I prove it. I just, something happens, and then I just, it's, I figure it out, but I can't ever tell anybody how e- I did it. Exactly, and Kurt Gödel said, Kurt Gödel said in principle, it. it would be impossible to, 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 to spell it out. That's well, Gödel's theorem. I teach classes on problem solving, but even yeah. those are just skirting at the surface. All you do is, you solve the problems, and the gifted ones say, oh, that's how you do it, and then they do it, right? And the rest of them just don't get it, right? Because it can't be. In mathematics, in mathematics, there can't be a recipe for solving problems. Kurt Gödel proved that in 1931. Well, I wrote my. And so, so, so this this is a good example. Here are the axioms. Here's a prove it. Okay, so I think about it. What am I doing when I'm thinking about it? I'm thinking about it. That's what I'm doing. You know, I'm just thinking about it, and then suddenly something hits me. And reliable mathematicians. It hits them regularly over and over and over again. So they're good at thinking about mathematical problems, but they're not doing the thinking in words. And there are many, many other examples of that. The savant that can multiply enormous numbers, when he describes how he does it, he tells this thing about how like, there are shapes of different colors and things, and they match together, and they mo- he, like, describes something really, really bizarre. Look, there are people who can look at a tree and say, 462, they see the number of leaves. It's like synesthesia. No, that's synesthesia is something that's crossing sensory modalities. That's a different thing. But there are people who have these mysterious abilities. They just look at things, you know, they, you spill uh, beans on the floor, they look and say, 278. And you say, why isn't 279? Because 279 looks different. 278 looks, looks one way, and 279 looks differently. <laughs> you know, you know, that's meaningless to us. <laughs> I don't have to count them one by one, you know. I, I couldn't do it any better than that. At any rate, the, the bottom line here is there's a lot of thought that's not in words. Koach, kochma, is like thought that's not in words. Bina puts it into words. It's a secondary step. Bina comes afterwards. Das is learning from experience, which is partially independent altogether. And Haskell is knowing what to do with your understanding to practically apply it and be successful. And they're all, and they're all definitely necessary for a whole ability to think about the world and deal with it. So, <clears throat> we have these here now. The, the phrase here, from yourself, as it's written on the page, it just doesn't do anything. But let me show you something very interesting. There's a list of blessings here. Yeah, take a look on page um, 229. Blessings of praise and gratitude, blessings over phenomena and events. Now, I don't know if you're aware... But if you see a world-famous mathematician, there's a blessing to be made on him. Or a world-famous uh, chemist. Or people who have great secular knowledge, 
there's a special blessing to be made. Also, when you see people who have great Torah knowledge, there's also a blessing to be made, but they're not the same blessing. And the difference is, this is the, the third from the bottom and, 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 and second from the bottom. The third, the third from the bottom is, upon seeing an outstanding Torah scholar, blessed Hashem our God, King of the universe, who has apportioned, apportioned, that means given a piece of. In the Hebrew it is chalak. Chalak is a piece. He's given a piece of his knowledge to those who fear him. By the way, the reason a person is a great Torah scholar is because God gave him Torah knowledge. And he gave him Torah knowledge because he fears him. That's why he's a great Torah scholar. Notice there's nothing here about brains, nothing here about what we call zitzflesh, ability to sit and concentrate. Great Torah knowledge is a divine gift. Okay. What do you say when you see a mathematician or a historian or somebody like that? Blessed are, uh, who has given of his knowledge to human beings. Sorry, say again? Yeah, it says the flesh and blood in Hebrew. Okay. I mean, I'm, that's, that's not what I want to focus on. But notice the difference in the verb. Here it's given. The other is apportioned. A piece of his knowledge. The first is there's something that God has and the person gets a piece of what God has. God has, meaning it qualifies him. The second is, there's an old tsar. There's a treasury house. And in the treasury house, God has lots of things. And one of the things is knowledge. And he gave him a piece of that knowledge from the treasury house. The former is much more intimate. And that's what the blessing is referring to. Give us these intellectual abilities from you. We want them to come from you. Not from the, not from the storehouse. Because we want it to be essentially a matter of Torah knowledge, Torah understanding, Torah experience. That's essentially what we're asking for. Okay, so that little one word, meitra, in, in the Hebrew, is a reference to this idea. We're together? Now, um, back to uh, 103, I think. There's a reason for the order of the blessings. Uh, here, there's some kind of elaborate intellectual gifts, then repentance, asking God, as we will see, for help in repairing our failures, and then forgiveness. The order is crucial. You need understanding, insight, appreciation in order to be able to evaluate yourself and know what your failures are. And you need to ask God for help in repairing those failures before you can step to the final position and say, and ask God for forgiveness. So there's a natural progression here. Not only is there a natural progression here, but if you look in the evening prayers on page 269, the gray paragraph, it's this blessing, the blessing that's titled Insight, and this gray paragraph is said Saturday night, or at the end of a festival, and here it describes the distinction between Shabbos and the weekdays, or the festival and the non-holy days. And uh, Talmud asks, why is this paragraph of distinguishing Sabbath and festivals from the other days in this particular blessing? And the answer that it gives, is a famous phraseology which is then used over and over again, im ein das havdola minayin. If there is no intellectual understanding, how can you make distinctions? In order to distinguish between Shabbos and holidays on the one hand and the non-holy days on the other hand, that requires a certain amount of understanding. So that's where it belongs. One of the great sages of Europe visited America before the war, Second World War, and when he came back, people asked him, what is it like in America? He said, they're very good at making kiddush they have a problem making Havdalah. They're very good at sanctifying things, elevating things, seeing the good in things. They have a great difficulty in making distinctions, dividing between the things that can be accepted and things that have to be rejected, so forth and so on. That's a very profound remark. <laughs> something like that, something like that. And um, this touches on a very widespread 
disease in contemporary society, and that is that everybody's good, everybody's valid, everybody's fine, you're okay, I'm okay, you know, you're okay, I'm okay. Um, and uh, no one should be criticized, no one should be rejected, no one should be, should be um, uh, evaluated as less than anybody else. There was a time, now I'm very ancient, you see, there was a time when it was a praise of a person to say he has discriminating taste. One would never say that today. Discriminating? Discriminating taste meant he was able to distinguish things that are different. One should do that, because if they really are different, and you don't know it, you're going to get into trouble. Not everything is equal. Not everything has the same qualities. And even the people who are against discrimination are also for discrimination. They're just too politically blinded to see that that's so, because ask them how they feel about people who discriminate. And all of a sudden, they're not forgiving, they're not equally accepting, not equally valid. No, those people are out. Those people are surely out. So everybody draws a line somewhere. You can't have any values at all unless you see things that are negative. If everything is equally positive, you have no values at all. At any rate, this, this is, is absolutely crucial. The ability to see that things are different and discriminate them uh, between them is an absolutely fundamental uh, ability. Okay, let's just start the next, next uh, blessing. This, this, is, this one is, uh, needs a lot of work. Bring us back, our Father, to your Torah. Uh, draw us cl close, our King, to your service. Return us in complete repentance, tshuva, before you. Blessed Hashem, the Hashem the one who desires tshuva. Tshuva is better than repentance, as we will see. Now, as you will notice in the first two phrases, it's father first and king second. It's always father first and king second. In the next blessing, you have the same thing. Forgive us our father, pardon us our king. Some of you know that at the uh, end of the Shemona Esrei, on certain days of the year, you have the our father, our king prayer, and that's, 30 of them, just a whole long string of, of sh very short one-line petitions, and it's our Father, our King. Never is it reversed. Now, given what I have told some of you, can you figure out why that is? Why it's always Father first and King second? Because we're, we're his children. He said it at the beginning. Sorry? Say again? The attribute of mercy always is attribute of justice. That's right. Father is loving kindness, and King is justice. And loving kindness always comes before justice. Loving kindness is the purpose of the entire creation. Justice is something which comes in for various purposes in the administering of the, cre of the creation. Those characteristics are not at all equal, and that's why Father always comes first, and King always comes second. Whereas other things do reverse, other two-word uh, two phrases do reverse from time to time, this never reverses, because it's an expression of that idea. That's why in our mitzvahs, right always takes precedence over left. Because right is loving kindness and left is justice. And therefore, right always, whenever you have a mitzvah that depends upon right and left, if you look carefully at how the mitzvah is performed, you'll see that right is, is central and, and left is, is secondary. So that's why is it now. Um, I'm going to make a remark, and tomorrow I will spell it out in more detail. Notice the order in which this repair is going to take place. Bring us back to your Torah. Bring us close to your, ser your service and return us in complete tshuva or repentance. Tshuva is the technique for undoing past failures. Notice that it's third here. The first two are help us do things that are right. Only after we ask for help in doing things that are right do we then ask for the ability to go through the process that takes care of our failures? This is a giant subject in Musser and in general in Jewish sources in what well, could be called Jewish psycho psychology and Jewish strategies for self-improvement. When you know that you have failures, what do you, what do you do first? Do you first address your failures and then go on to improve yourself in positive ways? Or do you first improve yourself in positive ways, 
leaving your failures in place. And only after that, go on to address your failures. This is a big subject because there's a verse in Psalms, Surah Rav, I say, turn away from evil and do good. And it sounds like that preaches doing, uh, confronting the evil first, eradicating the evil first, and then doing good. Here, the way I'm reading this blessing, sounds like the opposite. So something has to be done to explain what the truth is about these matters. And there's a giant literature, and there's some discussion between the Muslim movement and the Hasidic movement on this subject. Muslim movement itself is inconsistent on this subject. We'll talk about that tomorrow.